Matthew chapter 13, we have, uh, we've been preaching this series for uh, a good while now, the kingdom of heaven. We're going to wind it down today. There may be one more uh, sermon in this series. I'm not sure, but uh, we're going to continue today. Hey, if you've got a red lever, red lever, a red letter Bible, you know that means that the words of Christ are in red. If you've got one of those Bibles, you may have noticed that Almost the entire chapter of chapter 13 is a direct teaching of Christ. There's a little bit of black in there, but most everything that is said in Matthew 13 uh, is a direct teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that it's more important than other parts of the Bible or more inspired? Uh, no. No, Paul told Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed. In other words, all of God's Word is from God. So it's not more inspired. I just thought it was kind of neat that chapter 13, uh, these parables and where Jesus makes the shift, where he starts teaching in parables, I just thought it was really neat that everything there is straight from the mouth of our Savior. Amen or not? So Jesus has uh, been teaching us in this chapter about his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I don't know about you, but man, it really clarifies some things. How many of y'all been going to church a long time? Some of you. That's good. How many of you have just seen things and experienced things throughout the years in church about how church is done, and you've went to a different church, and they do it different? I'm not talking about the colors and all the amenities and any of that, but doctrinal stuff, you know, how salvation is presented. And How many of you just ever wondered, Where'd that come from? Is, is that right? Did, did, who showed them how to do that? Who says we got to do this? Well, I'll be honest with you, and I've been in the ministry for about 25 years now, and I worry sometimes about the things we do in churches. Uh, and when you read a passage like Matthew 13, and you see what Jesus said, not what Southern Baptists say, not what missionary Baptists say, not what Methodist or Pentecost or Episcopal or any of the other 32,000 denominations says, but what Jesus says. It makes you just kind of sit up in your seat and say, hmm, wow. What about all this other stuff? Can I just tell, you to, tell this to you? It doesn't matter what Brother Tracy says if Jesus says different. Are y'all all right? It doesn't matter what someone else says. If God's word says different, always, always go with God's word. Inerrant, infallible word of God. Always go with it. You'll never go wrong, amen or not. I believe that with all my heart. So the kingdom of heaven. First thing he does in the first two parables, the parable of the soils or the parable of the sower, sometimes it's got a different title, and the parable of the wheat and the tares. Those two parables, our Lord gives them to us for us to understand the nature of his kingdom. Now, let me say a word about the kingdom. And this is a long sermon, and Jimmy's done told me I, I need to cut her short. He's got things to do, so I'm going to hurry through this. But uh, the kingdom of heaven flows through history, human history. It will step off into uh, the millennial kingdom of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And then it will go over into eternity. But right now, the kingdom of heaven works inside of what's known as the church age. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, the apostles, the seeds of the church began ministry here on planet earth. And in Acts 2, you see the church born. And that began the church age. And for these 2,000 years or so, we've been in the church age. We'll be in the church age until the Lord returns and begins his millennial kingdom or the rapture. Let's, let's end it there. So in this church age that we live in, the Lord wants us to understand the nature of what his kingdom looks like. Uh, in the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils, we see responses, various responses 
that is given to the message of the kingdom. And the message of the kingdom is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus is the Savior who graciously forgives and saves. That's the message of the kingdom. There's lots of responses to that. We see them in the parables. Some of them are quick and sudden change that don't last. Some of them responds with affirmative yes to Jesus, and then there's a length of time where they seemingly are operating inside of his kingdom and along and lining up with his word. And then, uh, as Peter says, the dog retur returns to the vomit. Uh, it just doesn't last. And then there are those that make a genuine citizen of the kingdom. And there's a new heart given. There's a new life given. Literally, there's a, there's a new man born from the power of God. And the kingdom of heaven becomes his priority. Uh, it's the pinnacle in his life. It's priority. And according to that parable, not me, but according to the parable, that man who has understanding, who receives the word, and then produces inside of the kingdom. See, that's not a works-based salvation. Salvation is always by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. That's the ingredients of salvation. But after a man is converted, after a woman's converted, the Bible is clear that there's evidence, unmistakable, undeniable evidence in that person's life that they are a true born-again citizen of the kingdom of heaven. This parable clarifies that, makes it undeniable. The wheat and the tares, the second parable, teaches us that in this church age, the kingdom of heaven may all look alike, but it's not all alike. Inside churches all across the land, there is wheat, those who are true citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and there's tares, those who are non-citizens, imposters and posers. And God knows. And his word on that is, hey, let them be. I'll pluck them up at the end and throw them in the fire. That's what the Lord says. He wants us to know the nature of the kingdom of heaven. The saved and the unsaved coexist inside of the kingdom. The third and fourth parables show us the influence that the kingdom of heaven should have. Using yeast as a parable and using the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds in the garden of Palestine. And the message is this, even though the kingdom starts very small, it grows very large and it has a powerful influence. One man can be saved and through that one man's salvation, a generation can be reached. One town can be influenced by one church, one small church. By the way, that's why it's important to plant churches. It's important. It's kingdom business to plant other churches. Some of y'all ought to be getting about ready to go plant a church. That's weird, ain't it? Preacher, you, what, what, what do you mean? I mean, really. Kingdom business calls for us to be kingdom-minded, which means some of you have been here a long time. Might be ready for you to go plant a church. You'd let us go. I'd help you move. Now, if that hits you funny, it's because you don't think like the kingdom operates. Michael said we spent the... Michael's gone. Oh, there he is. We spent Friday with some more pastors and, and got to hear from another a missionary about the heart of God and what it looks like. And what it did, man, it blessed me, Michael, because it affirmed so many things that we're doing. It really, it affirms so many things. The kingdom should be on the move. The kingdom should be influential. Church in the 21st century has relegated to coming in here and sitting down and then leaving and calling it church. You don't see it anywhere in Scripture. That's man's church. That's what man has decided to do with God's kingdom. Show up at church, sing a few songs, call it good. That's why our culture, by the way, is crumbling all around us. The influence of the kingdom has dwindled to nothing. They used to build churches and build towns around them. 
the influence. The Lord wants us to know of that. The mustard seed grows into a tree. The yeast permeates the whole loaf of dough. That's the way the kingdom of heaven is to operate. Here uh, in the... Oh, then we see... I'm sorry, I'm going to skip this. Then we see how to acquire the kingdom. And this is really where it, I think we've gotten off track. Man, we've, we've just preached this easy believism. And by the way, it's not hard to come to Christ. It's not hard to be saved. Jesus has done everything that needs to be done in order for a lost man to be saved. I believe that always will be. But there's something dynamic that takes place. In the fifth and sixth parable, the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable uh, of the pearl of great cost, we see what it takes to acquire the kingdom of heaven, what it takes to be a true citizen of the kingdom of heaven, what it takes to truly be saved, and that is a sellout. According to this parable in the Lord's own word, if you're going to come to Jesus and be a part of his kingdom, you got to be a sellout, a sellout to him. There's a willingness there to trade your life for his life. There's a willingness there to not only allow him to work through you, but a desire for him to work through you, and you're willing to count the cost and give up what it takes. I told the first service we go through every morning here at the Cowboy Church, a study called Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby. Challenging. Man, just when you think you're doing good, just when you think you're batting 300, just when you think you're knocking the ball over the fence every time for Jesus, you you read uh, Experiencing God and you realize, man, you're pitiful. You're terrible. You ain't doing nothing. And all he does is just simply show us scripture and slows us down calls us to dissect that scripture and the truth of it such as what jesus said if you're not willing to give up everything you cannot be my disciple let that sink in how many wants to follow jesus this morning show of hands okay a bunch of folks don't want to follow jesus i want to follow him all the way to heaven the bible says if i want to follow jesus I have to have a willingness to give up everything. That's not my theology. That's what Jesus, the Savior, said. That's what the one who spoke and the world leapt into existence said. That's what the one who died on the cross for our sins said. If you want to be my disciple, you have to be willing to give up everything. There was a rich young ruler. Remember him? He came to Jesus. He's a good teacher. What must I do to inherit heaven follow the commandments and then he named off a few and the rich man said i'm already doing that he said go sell all of your possessions give them to the poor then come and follow me the bible says he went away sad most people do narrow is the way the broad road leads somewhere else we're going to talk about that in a little while narrows the way These parables, and the reason Jesus started teaching in these parables was to get to the heart of the matter, get the truth on the bottom shelf so everyone would have access to it, and then it becomes judgment to us. How do I acquire the kingdom of heaven? I trade my life for his. That's how simple it is. I trade my life for his. And then today... Probably the last installment, we'll see. Jesus offers the final parable in chapter 13. The parable of the dragnet. So if you've got your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 13, let's read verses 47 through 51. You there? Say amen. By the way, I got me a new Bible. Ain't pretty. Man, I can shake this dude and it won't fall apart. I don't have to worry about who's holding it because it's My other one is just, man, it's just falling apart. By the way, it's a different version Bible. This is a New American Standard Bible. I've preached for the last 10 years out of a uh, New International Version Bible, and this is what I'll be preaching out of. Uh, So if it's a little different, you'll know why. But anyway, let's do that in, no extra cost. Let's read. Verse 47, again. Why does he say again? He wants us to understand the context has not changed. From verse 1 of chapter 13 to where we are at the end, he wants us to understand he's still 
talking about. He's still concerned with the kingdom of heaven. Nothing's changed. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. Let's pray. Father, it's a privilege again to come, Lord, in this second service before you, preaching your word. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you would do what you did in the first service. Holy Spirit, teach us, guide us, open our hearts, remove the distractions, help us, Lord, to for just a little while to forget about what we're going to do after this is over, where we're going to go eat, and what we're going to do the rest of the day, Lord. Help us to be students of your word. Educate us this morning with knowledge from above. Speak to us deep into our souls. Save us if we're lost. Help us, Father, if we're weary. Don't let us be led astray. Let us follow your truth, Lord Jesus. We can't get this done without you. So, Lord, we ask that you teach us for your kingdom's sake and your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing the Lord does in this parable is he paints us a picture that he wants us to see. And he begins in verse 47, uh, painting the picture of a fishing scene, which would have been very familiar to his audience. And he says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a a dragnet. This is the first thing he wants us to see, a dragnet. Our Lord gives us this picture because his kingdom is like a dragnet. Now, in this culture, and really still in ours too, if you know anything about fishing, There's a couple of nets that were used in that day. One was a throw net. It was a one-man net that could be thrown, and when it would throw, it would open up. It would land on the water. It was weighted around the seams, the bottom, and it would sink very rapidly. And anything that was under it, when the string was pulled by the fishermen to reel it back in, the weights would close the net up, and anything that was under it would be caught in the net. That was a one-man net, and that's not what he's talking about. Then there was a drag net, which was very, very large. It took several men, uh, many, multiple men, to operate this net. And a drag net would be either attached to both banks and move toward the shore, if they were in a cove or something like that. But normally it would be attached to one bank of the sea, and then it would go way out into the sea, and men in boats, or if they could stand up, if they were in shallow enough water, they would be on their feet. The bottom of that net would be weighted where it would drag along the bottom, and they would, in a circular motion, come back to the bank. And everything that was in front of that net would be schooled into the bank, and anything that was on bottom would would be caught up in this net, and they would eventually reach the, the shoreline on the other side, and Everything was caught in that net. Nothing that was in that area, nothing that was on the bottom escaped that net. They would drag it up on the shore, and then they would begin the process of separation. This is a picture of how God's judgment works in the end. He painted this picture here in Uh, Verse 48, he says, when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and they gathered the good fish in the containers and the bad fish they threw away. Notice they didn't throw the bad fish back in the water, which is probably what me and you would do. If you're a fisherman and you catch a rough fish, you probably don't paddle over to the bank and throw it up on it. Probably just put it back in the water, right? Well, this is a picture of judgment, And the Lord wants us to clearly see that this is how his judgment works. First of all, nothing escapes. Every man that has ever been created throughout all of human history at the end of the age will stand in judgment before their creator. 
Nothing will escape this dragnet of judgment. All of us will be judged. Second thing, there's a separation that's going to take place. And in verse 48, uh, he calls them good and bad. Now, the Bible says that no one's good, not even one. How do we apply that then? The only way we could ever be seen as good or worthy or valuable is the righteousness of Christ has to be applied to us. Salvation has to take place. We have to pass from death to life. Our sins have to pass under the blood of Christ, be forgiven. That is where the goodness comes in. And those who are considered bad are those who have rejected, flat out rejected the goodness of God, the grace of Christ, are those who have dilly-dallied with it. Those who are not true citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Those who have said a prayer once upon a time. They've been through the waters of baptism, but there's no evidence in their life that they work in the kingdom of heaven. There's no passion about Christ. There's no passion about the things of God. Or there's no calling on their life. There's no, there, there's no, they're not driven for the kingdom of heaven. The evidence just isn't there. The Bible says they're separated. The next thing he shows us is in verse 49. Now, that first thing that he showed us in verse 47 and 48 was a picture of judgment. And the next thing he shows us is in verse 48. It's the principles of judgment. Verse 49, I'm sorry. There's a principle. In this verse, the Lord shows us his principle of judgment. Now, by the way, this is not a detailed description of how judgment will take place this parable the lord's the lord's subject is those that are lost all will be judged those who belong to him and those who do not belong to him but in this parable the point that he's making is those that are lost those who have rejected him stand in judgment so here we see uh, from the separation we go into the principle uh, and the Lord refers really to the great white throne judgment in this um, verse here. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Uh, we're not going to go there, but that is the last judgment. That is the judgment to close out the age of humanity. After the great white throne judgment, eternity starts. There's no more judgment after that. And that's a reference to what the Lord is talking about here. He points to it. We've already seen that in the previous parables during this church age, the kingdom of heaven, we, under, we have to understand the nature of it. Uh, there's unbelievers and believers that coexist inside the church. Now, they would all say they're believers, but the Lord would say otherwise. But there comes this separation at the end of the age that no one will escape, that no one will dismiss themselves from. There's no one who... Well, be able to say, hey, I got things to do. I can't make that. That's not the way it's going to work. This picture shows us this dragnet, which represents the judgment of God. And I want you to, I want you to, I want you to see the picture that the Lord has, has painted for you this morning. And I want you to see that dragnet that, that, that is moving slowly through the waters as God's hand of judgment that is moving slowly through humanity, through our lives. And inside that giant net, we have freedoms. Man, we get to make decisions. We get up every day. We decide where we're going to go and what we're going to do and what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, where we're going to work, on and on and on. There's freedoms within that judgment net that, that, that moves through our lives. But every day, every day, that net is getting closer and closer to the shoreline, which is eternity. All of us are being moved. Whether we like it or not, you can't escape it. No one can add not one day to their life. We all are being moved closer to the shoreline where a separation will take place. Inside the freedoms that we have, we do different things, and that's the point of the previous parables. Men respond to the gospel in different ways. 
There are those that have said a prayer and they're comfortable in that prayer. There are those who uh, uh, attend church that are comfortable doing that. Uh, there are those who have been through the waters of baptism. Matter of fact, we're going to baptize a young lady at the end of this service. But when we get to the shore, what matters is that we are true, genuine citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And there's a separation that will take place. And in this parable we see in verse 49, at the end of this age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. Now, the Lord doesn't get into the rapture of the church. He doesn't get into the millennial reign. He is fast-forwarding to the end of the age, the great white throne judgment, where only the unrighteous will stand. There is no Christians at the great white throne judgment. We've already been judged. But here, only the wicked of the ages, if you go to that passage and look it up, they're they're from humanity's very beginnings all the way to that point. Stand before the king. Verse 49 says they will be taken out among. Verse 50, which shows us the peril of the judgment. How serious is this judgment? It's the most serious thing that has ever happened. It's the most serious conversation that you and I can have. It's the most serious thing that can be talked about. Matter of fact, most folks don't want to talk about it. Matter of fact, most folks busy themselves in life so they don't have to think about it. Uh, you and I stay very distracted in life so that we don't have to think that that dragnet is moving us ever closer to the shoreline. But it is. And in the peril of judgment, the Lord focuses on those that are separated and are wicked, those who do not belong to him, those who are fakes and frauds and non-citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And then he talks about the peril of judgment, which again is a picture of the great white throne judgment. You know, perhaps there is no subject that is not talked about. There, there is no subject that makes us more uneasy, avoided, if you will, than the subject of hell. Preachers don't preach about it no more. It's a very unpopular uh, subject. We do everything we can not to think about it. Uh, it doesn't come up in circles of conversation, even spiritual circles. But can I tell you that Jesus Christ himself spoke more about hell than he ever did heaven. Jesus Christ spoke lots of times about hell and warned people about hell a whole lot more than he spoke on the love of God. Matter of fact, in the 33 years of Jesus' ministry, according to Scripture, it was his common practice to warn people about hell he spoke of it a lot more than the prophets did he spoke of it a lot more than the apostles did he warned people to avoid hell at all costs to take hold of the gracious loving offer of salvation that he was going to provide in matthew 5 22 he warned about hell in matthew 5 29 he warned about hell and then the very next verse verse 30 he warned about hell again Matthew 18, 8 and 9, he warned about the perils of hell, the eternity that will be spent in hell. In Matthew 9, 43, he warned about hell. In Matthew 18, 12, Jesus warned those that were imposing imposters in the kingdom. They called themselves sons of the kingdom, but he said, you shall be cast into outer darkness. In that place, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's hell. Listen to me, friend. I ain't trying to scare you. I ain't trying to get you on the edge of your seat. I've, I've listened to preachers preach about hell, and they did their dead level best to make it worse than it is. Friend, you don't have to do anything to the subject of hell. It's frightening. The human mind can't imagine the perils of hell. We, our mind won't imagine eternity 
let alone spend an eternity in hell. But Jesus Christ said it's a literal place. It's not for us. It wasn't prepared for us. Scripture's clear on that. Jesus himself said that it was prepared for Satan and the fallen angels. But those who refuse to take hold of his grace and his forgiveness will find themselves at the end of the age in a literal hell. Matthew 23, 33, Jesus asked the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees this question. How shall you escape the sentence of hell? All throughout Jesus' earthly ministry from beginning to end, he warns of the torment of hell because those who would reject him will spend eternity there without him. It's very popular in the 21st century to make light of hell. Lots of jokes about hell. Can I just tell you, nothing that's ever been written about hell that's funny. It's nothing ever been written about hell to soften it, uh, to make anything good about it, uh, to make it a pleasant place. Nothing has ever been written about hell to make it some place that you'd even want to visit. Here in this century that we live in, hell has been relegated to a joke. Uh, Hollywood has uh, made us believe that uh, Satan lives in hell. He's got a throne down there, and he's just uh, some mythological creature that sits there, and all of his fallen angels are hanging out with him, and there's flames everywhere, and he kind of likes the thermostat to be turned high, and he's just hanging out down there waiting on some people to get there. Can I tell you the truth of God's Word says this? Satan ain't in hell right now. Matter of fact, there ain't nobody in hell right now. Hell begins after the great white throne judgment. There's millions upon millions upon millions of people in Hades, which is the abode of the dead. Those who have rejected Christ reside today in a place of punishment, but it's not the final place of punishment. It's not the lake of fire. They will be brought out of that place and stand at the great white throne judgment and they will be judged according to what they have done or have not done with the grace of God. The, devils, the devil and his fallen angels, they're not going to enjoy hell. It was prepared to punish them. So when eternity begins and the lake of fire fills up, Satan will be there, yes, but he's not the king there. He's not running the place. He's suffering just like everyone else that's there, and he will continue to suffer for all eternity. There will be no end. It's not a fun place. It's not a funny place, but we've made a mockery out of it. When the Lord warns about it, the Lord pleads with people, don't go there. Turn to me. Someone invented a long time ago, R.I.P., rest in peace. For those good old boys that die off, and we preach them into heaven at their funeral. That ain't true, and that ain't real. When a man leaves this life, there's two places he can go. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Those who belong to Christ at the moment, their last brain wave happens. Their last uh, air comes into their lung. They leave this planet and they go to be with their Savior, Jesus Christ. On the other side of the coin, those who draw their last breath here, they don't go rest in peace. Those who don't know Jesus Christ and those who have rejected him, they don't drift off into nothingness. They're sent to Hades awaiting judgment. Well, I'm, I'm just an old cowboy preacher, and I'm just going to ride off in the sunset. They'll write a song about me, and I'll just kind of disappear uh, over the horizon, and I'll rest in peace. That's a myth. That's a myth, friend. You won't. If you leave this world without Jesus, if you're not a true citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you won't rest in peace. Matter of fact, you won't rest. You'll live your eternity in torment. 
Boy, preacher, that's uh, it's not what I come here to hear. Well, I get that. Nobody wants to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to preach about it. But it's there. Jesus spent most of his ministry warning people, don't go there. I love you too much not to talk about reality. When Jesus says there's a literal hell, when we read the great words of John the Revelator and describes it as a lake of fire, it's there. It awaits those outside of salvation, those who have rejected Jesus Christ, those who are playing church. It's real. It's not for you, but it's what you'll receive. Somebody better start preaching about it again. Hey, we're running out of time here. Hey, parents, you better tell your children about it. Life ain't all full of roses and and good times. At the end of this deal, when the dragnet reaches the shore, those who have rejected Jesus Christ will be sorted. And they'll stand before the one who died for their sins. Now, I want to paint a picture for you. The Bible says, John the Revelator in Revelations 20, starting at verse 11, that appeared a great white throne. He says, heaven and earth fled from its presence because on that throne is the one who spoke and the world leapt into existence. He's the one who knit you together and knit me together in our mother's womb. From the moment we were knit together, a soul was given to that body that will never, ever die. Somewhere it will live on in eternity, either with God or apart from God in a place called hell. The Bible says when those who stand at that great white throne judgment stand before the Creator, they're going to look into the face of, listen to me, the one who died so they wouldn't be there. Get that. Don't miss that. They have to look into the face of what was and could have been their Savior, which is now their judge. And because they have rejected him, made a mockery of him, now they stand before him as judge. Friend, let me tell you, all the emphasis on the one who's being judged, I want you to think about the judge for a minute. Think about the one who left the splendors of heaven, who come to this rotten old world to die for somebody like me so that I'd never have to stand in front of his great white throne, so that I could stand at the beam of judgment after Christ has called me home and I could receive my crowns for what I've done here in his name and I could cast them at the feet of the king. But those who stand at that great white throne, they have to look. They have to look at those hands. Those holes are still there. And they'll realize all of my eternity is set. In an instant, I'm going to be thrown into what I smell and what I see. But standing before me is salvation that I no longer can have. I've rejected it all my life and now it stands in front of me and I can't have it. And it breaks the heart of Jesus because all he did so we wouldn't have to be there breaks his heart. Jesus is telling us this is what the kingdom of heaven has to do in order to get into eternity. There's the tares and the wheats. They're growing up together in the church. He has to separate them before eternity can begin. And there has to be a judgment. Hell is literal. Hell is forever. In Mark's gospel, chapter 9, verse 42, again, the words of Jesus straight out of his mouth. Verse 42 says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone hung around his neck and he had been cast into the sea. Now, it don't really matter, but I'm just going to tell you the little ones he's talking about, that's not children. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about new Christians. 
And then in verse 43, I want you to, I want you to hear from the words of Christ, the perils of hell. How serious this is. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It would be better for you to enter life. And when he says life, he's talking about eternal life. He's talking about heaven. It would be better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell and to the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus gives a metaphor. Anything, listen to me, anything that would come between you and you being a true citizen of the kingdom of heaven, count it as loss, cut it off, get rid of it. Don't miss the kingdom of heaven no matter what it takes. Because when you get there, he said two things. First of all, the fire is unquenchable. There's no relief. Second of all, he says something rather odd. The worm dieth not. He said that three times. The worm dieth not. What's that all about? Jesus is emphasizing the eternity of hell. In the ancient world, there were no caskets. There were no vaults to bury bodies in. Bodies were put into tombs or into graves. Didn't matter. The worms always had their way. And that body would be consumed by those that lived in the earth, the worms. But when the flesh was gone, all that was left was the bones. So when the flesh was gone, the worms were no more. Jesus says in hell, the worms won't die because the body won't die. It's a bit of a parable himself. Eternity. We live on forever and ever and ever. Now, that'll, that'll open up a lot of questions for a lot of people, and it should. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that God has set eternity in the heart of man. Every day you wake up, you need to understand that's a day closer to eternity. Every day is a gift. That's for, that's for sure. That's true. But it's also one step closer to eternity. The dragnet for so many getting closer and closer and closer where this judgment will take place. We've played church for so long. We've tried to build monstrous structures, make them glamorous. The kingdom is on the move. The kingdom is growing. The kingdom is influential. The kingdom is full of wheat. It's also full of tares. But as the kingdom gets ready to move into eternity, the tares, the frauds, the fakes, the shammers, they will be pulled up by the roots and thrown into the fire. By the way, the angels twice in this parable, in these parables, the angels perform that action. Why is that? Do you think any man would voluntarily commit themselves to an eternity in a lake of fire? No. They will be thrown. Matter of fact, Scripture says it right there. They will be thrown into the lake of fire. The last thing Jesus says in this closing parable to those he is teaching, mostly his disciples. He says, have you understood all these things? Have you understood all of these things? There are men and women who go to church all their lives who have heard sweet little sugar tits for sermons, 
who have been told, say a prayer, you'll be okay. I can't find that in Scripture. I can't find that in Scripture. Well, Brother Tracy, do you mean you can't communicate your need to Jesus and confess your sins through prayer and he saved you? No, it's not what I mean. I mean, what I see in Scripture is when a man or a woman cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. First of all, the only way they can do that is God does a work in their life. God wakes up their stony heart and makes it flesh. And they see themselves for how they are. They see their great need, and then they cry out. And he hears every time. And after he makes that man, after he makes that woman new, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.17 comes to life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. The past is gone. Then that person begins to walk in the kingdom. Their passion becomes for kingdom things. Their mind is on the kingdom. Their energy is spent in the kingdom. Church is not an afterthought. The kingdom of heaven is not an afterthought. It's a priority. I don't want to be the preacher to preach you into hell. I want to be the preacher to preach you into heaven. When I stand before the Lord, according to James 3, 1, I will be judged with a more harsher judgment than you. That's what James said. He said, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you will be judged with a more harsh judgment. My responsibility to stand in this pulpit is to preach the whole word of God. I don't want to stand there in front of Jesus Christ myself and him say, son, I sent you people. I sent you people every Sunday. And you offered them a gimmick. You sold them a pig and a poke. Depart from me, I never knew you. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. That's what I'm striving for. It's what I'm working for. That's my passion, to hear, well done, Tracy. I don't hear that a lot on earth. <laughs> I haven't heard that a lot in my life, but I'm looking forward to looking into the face of Jesus Christ and hearing him say, well done, boy. That's all that matters to me. And to see you there too. Hell's real. Those of you who are listening to me on Facebook, you're in your seats at home and you're comfortable. Hell's real. Always has been, always will be. Jesus pleaded, don't go there. I'm pleading with you. Don't go. Don't go. Turn to Jesus, just like you are. Don't wait to get gooder. It ain't going to happen. Don't wait for a better day. Don't wait for a better church. Don't wait for a better preacher. Don't wait for a funny feeling. Today, cry out to Jesus if you've never done it. He'll hear you. And he'll answer you. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Tracy Wilson. Thank you so much for being with us uh, via Facebook or YouTube or however you're watching us, whether it be a Wednesday night round pen or a Sunday morning uh, service here at the Cowboy Church. Just wanted to say hello and give you a personal invite to come and be with us here at the Cowboy Church. Uh, there's three options for you. Sunday mornings, we have a 9 a.m. service, uh, and then a second service at 1030 a.m. And then on Wednesday nights, uh, we do what we call a round pen Bible study, which is just getting into the heart of God's Word and studying it for all it's worth. We would love to meet with you uh, here in person at the Cowboy Church. We're so thankful for uh, technology. We've gotten uh, comments on our uh, sermons and Bible studies uh, all the way from Africa. And so we're so thankful. But uh, we do want to invite you here with us uh, to be uh, in person, in-house at the Cowboy Church. You know, the Bible says this about salvation. The Bible says clearly in Ephesians 2.8 that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, 
so no man can boast. Our prayer is that through these messages and through these Bible studies, uh, that the Word of God would uh, find its place in your heart. The promise is that God's Word will not return void. So we want to make ourselves available to you uh, for any thing that we can do to help you. If you have questions about this Jesus that we preach about, this Jesus that we serve, this Jesus that we know as our Savior and that the Bible declares as the only Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you would have a question about that, if we could help you with that, or if God deals with your heart through one of our sermons or Bible studies, and you've responded to that, and you've put your hope and trust, and you've committed to follow Jesus Christ, we would love to celebrate with you about that. We'd love to talk with you about that, help you in any way that we can. If you're watching, then obviously you have Facebook or uh, the availability of YouTube. Uh, if we can do anything, I would love for you to personally message me on Facebook. And I would love to correspond with you about this. God is able and He is able to meet all of our needs. He has extended His grace to us uh, through the offer of forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. I hope that you have taken advantage of that. I hope that you belong to Christ. And please take advantage of Three Trees Cowboy Church. Being here in person or just allowing us to message with you and help you in any way we can. Until then, until we see you in person or we see that message, God bless you and thank you for being with us.